Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's disease medications. Okay, right. So we're in the process of discussing the anatomy of the cerebral ventricles. Okay, one, because the cerebral ventricles are going to enlarge in Alzheimer's disease, and this is one of the key pathological uh, features of the disease. Okay, and two, because actually knowing this anatomy is going to help us all. Uh, help us a lot later, okay, when we need to discuss other structures that are very much so involved in the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, okay, uh, we'll, we will know, well, we'll be able to describe very easily where they are having done all of this neuroanatomy. Okay, right, so we've now done the third ventricle, okay, and just to make sure that I've put across the concept of what a ventricle actually is, a ventricle is a chamber within the brain which is full of cerebrospinal fluid, okay, so we've seen the third ventricle here which is going to be full of cerebrospinal fluid. Now what we're going to go on to is discussing the fourth ventricle. Okay, so the fourth ventricle, to outline where its position is going to be, it's going to be behind the pons and the medulla here, and in front of the cerebellum, okay, so to try and put its position on this picture here, really you're going to have a hollowing here, okay, so cut out that bit of the cerebellum that I've drawn there, that was uh, an oversimplification, in fact there is a hollowing here, okay, between the front of the cerebellum and the back of the pons and the medulla, okay, and this is going to be the fourth ventricle, okay, now it's going to be continuous with the third ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct, so basically the cerebral aqueduct is going to come down through the pons like so, and then it's going to open out, and then you're going to have the fourth ventricle here, okay, and then it's going to close back up again, and you're going to form a tube again, and this is going to be the tube that goes through the entire spinal cord, like so, and that's known as the central canal of the spinal cord. So flowing down the middle of the spinal cord, you have a tube, okay, which is full of cerebral spinal fluid, and this tube is known as the central canal uh, of the spinal cord. Okay, right. So. I now want to draw another picture for you where we look at this from the back so that I can explain more how the cerebral aqueduct is going to open up. Okay, so let me get another piece of paper to do this. Okay, right, so I'll put that aside. Right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the brain stem from the back, basically. Okay, so we'll start at the top with the midbrain. Okay, so here then is the back of the midbrain here. Now, the back of the midbrain is not smooth, we've discussed this, we're going to have the colliculi facing uh, out towards us when we're looking from the back, okay, we're going to have the two superior colliculi here, and then underneath the two superior colliculi we're then going to have the inferior colliculi. So if you didn't understand the colliculi previously, hopefully now this picture makes it really clear because now you can most definitely see the four colliculi, two superior colliculi, the left and the right, and then the two inferior colliculi uh, here, the left collicul inferior colliculus and the right inferior, inferior colliculus. Okay, right, uh, so I think I'll colour the midbrain in in red again. Okay, so this is our midbrain here, and then underneath we're now going to have the pons. Okay, now, uh, the pons has quite a complicated structure when you see it from the back. Okay, so bear me with me whilst I draw this. Okay, so the pons is going to sort of swell out like this, and then you're going to have two large structures here, okay? And these only look like this because I'm imagining that we've cut through it, okay? Now, I did not show these on my previous oversimplified drawings uh, on the other page, okay? But these structures that I am now showing should have been here, okay? You should have had these structures coming out like so, and these structures are um, peduncles, which are 
entering the cerebellum, okay? So they're carrying nerve fibers which are going into the cerebellum. Okay, now these ones are the biggest that we're seeing here, and these are actually the middle cerebellar peduncle. So there are two of them. There's a left middle cerebellar peduncle, and then the right middle cerebellar peduncle. Okay, and they're on the back of the pons, and they're entering the cerebellum. Okay, so in reality, we're, we've cut through them, which is why we're seeing these cut surfaces here. In reality, they'd be entering the uh, cerebellum, okay, which is, you know, it's out of the page, sitting here kind of thing. Okay, so this is the middle cerebellar peduncle, specifically that one that we're pointing to is the right middle cerebellar peduncle. Okay, right. You've also got superior cerebellar peduncles and inferior cerebellar peduncles, which I'll add on in a moment. Okay, then the pons is going to sort of reconverge to a smaller structure, and then you've got the medulla below here. Okay, like so. And then you'll have the spinal cord below that. Okay, so here's the spinal cord. And then I'll put foramen magnum there to orient us. Right, uh, so. Let me now, before I do anything else, put on the superior cerebellar peduncle and also the inferior cerebellar peduncle. So these are the superior cerebellar peduncles, and here are the inferior cerebellar peduncles. So those are also points where neurons are going into the cerebellum in the case of the inferior cerebellar peduncles, and in the case of the superior cerebellar peduncles here, uh, that's the main output peduncle. That's where fibres are coming out of the cerebellum and going back into the rest of the brain. So this is the superior cerebellar peduncle. Okay, again, it's specifically the right superior cerebellar peduncle. Okay, and then here we've got the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Now, what's also happening is the pons is effectively opening, and I'm going to show this like so. Okay. And then it recloses down here. Okay, and there are tubes opening here and here basically. This is the bottom of the cerebral aqueduct. The cerebral aqueduct has come in, well, it's come down through the midbrain and then through the upper portion of the pons here, and it's been concealed. Okay, we can't see it, it's deep inside. Now, effectively, you're opening it up. Okay, it's becoming this much larger structure here, okay, which will be sitting in between the pons anteriorly here, okay, and then the cerebellum which will be sitting here, okay, so the cerebellum is going to form the back, well, the back wall of this chamber basically, okay, and then it's going to reconverge into a very small tube to run through the back of the medulla and then into the spinal cord and become the central canal of the spinal cord. Okay, right, and this great big cavity that we've got here, which is going to be full of cerebrospinal fluid, this then, this is the fourth ventricle. Okay, right, so I hope that explains how uh, the cerebral aqueduct effectively opens up into this bigger structure that's confined between the pons anteriorly and then the cerebellum posteriorly. Okay, right. So now let's go in the opposite direction. Let's go and see number one and number two. Okay, so you hardly ever hear people call the first and second ventricles the first and second ventricles. Instead, you hear people call the first and second ventricles the lateral ventricles. Okay, so basically, you have a left lateral ventricle and a right lateral ventricle, and one of them is the first ventricle and one is the second ventricle. However, they are completely symmetric. Okay, so I have no idea whether anyone has actually decided whether the la left one is going to be called number one and the right one is going to be called number two, or whether the right one is going to be called number one and the left one is going to be called number two. I doubt anyone has decided that, but potentially someone has. Okay, however, they are the first and the second ventricles, it's just no one ever actually calls them that. People call them the left lateral ventricle and the right lateral ventricle. Okay, so let me show these structures. So, firstly, I am now going to go back to showing a picture on the left-hand side like this, okay? And I'm going to show you the left lateral ventricle, and it's going to be sitting in front of all these structures that we've seen previously. Okay, so I'm going to draw some of the bits from here again, and then I'm going to draw the left lateral ventricle, which is going to be sitting in front of uh, the structures here. 
Okay, now the right lateral ventricle will be doing exactly the same thing on the right hand side. It will be the mirror image of this left one. Okay, right. So let's do this. So, let me draw the left lateral ventricle first, and then I'll draw the other structures peeping out from behind it. Okay, so, here we go. Here is the head, then, of the left lateral ventricle. Okay, and then it curves round like so. Okay, and then it has this tail portion coming off down here. Okay, right. And this is stretching through uh, the left cerebral hemisphere. Okay, so let me put the other structures that we know then peeping out from behind this. So, you'll have the hypothalamus peeping out from behind this here. So here's the optic chiasm. Here then is the uh, pituitary gland. Okay, and I'm not going to be able to draw all of it. There we go. There's the mammillary body. Okay, and then behind us here, what we're going to have is the midbrain here. Okay, and then we're also going to have the thalamus sitting on top there. Okay, so these are the structures that we've seen previously, and now they're behind this left um, lateral ventricle here. Okay, so this portion is in the frontal lobe, if we go back to our picture of the cerebral cortex. Okay, so here is our left cerebral hemisphere here. Okay, this portion is in this frontal portion here. In fact, I might even draw it here. Okay, here's the head. Okay, then this little projection here is in the temporal lobe portion down here, and then the tail stretches into the occipital portion there. Okay, so this is the left lateral ventricle. Okay, now you're going to have the exact equivalent in the right hemisphere as well, and it will be fully symmetrical down the uh, sagittal midline of the brain. Okay, right. Now, how does this thing connect to the third and the fourth ventricles? Well, if I do this in sort of dashed lines, I'm going to draw you another picture showing this better. Basically, there is a little pipe, if you like, connecting this sort of portion of the uh, lateral ventricle here to a portion of the third ventricle, which we know is inside uh, the hypothalamus and between the two thalami here. Okay, so... This picture, then, is the left lateral ventricle. Okay, now, I'm going to draw, then, the left lateral ventricle from another aspect. We're now going to go uh, to looking at this from above. Okay, but before I do that, I'd just like to put on a bit of colour here, because I've kind of abandoned using colours for the time being. Okay, so let's make it look a little bit more interesting by colouring it in. So all of this... This is our left lateral ventricle here, and I'll colour that in in orange. Okay, let's colour in the other structures as well. So we'd coloured in previously the hypothalamus in pink, so let's stick to that. So here in pink, this is all the uh, hypothalamus here, and of course we're only seeing the left-hand side of the hypothalamus now, the left wall of the hypothalamus. Okay, here it is. Then we've got the thalamus behind the hypothalamus here in turquoise, and we can only see a little bit of the thalamus, of course. Okay, and then we've got the midbrain, which unfortunately was also coloured in orange, but I'll dash it to make it look different. Okay, then we'll also mark in the pituitary gland here in green. Okay, right, so now let's draw this picture from another angle. Let's draw it from above, because if we draw it from above, we will be able to see this connection between the lateral ventricle and the third ventricle more easily. Okay, so, uh, how am I going to do this? Where have I got the most space? Probably here. Okay, so, let's redraw then the hypothalamus here. So this is the wall of the hypothalamus here. Okay, and we know that this is the third ventricle here. Okay, now what you're going to have is the lateral ventricle is going to be sitting here. That's difficult to show because if you looked from above, really, you'd pretty much only see the top here. You wouldn't see this fantastic curvature here. So I'm going to kind of use a bit of artistic license here and draw it almost on a slant. Okay, just so that I can draw the more interesting parts of it. So here, this is this portion that's in the temporal lobe here, and then here's the head. Okay, so this is the um, left lateral ventricle, and of course you'd also have the right lateral ventricle, and I should probably try and show this here as well. 
Okay, so here's the symmetric right lateral ventricle here. Oops, and I'm sorry, we're running out of space, which is why this one's ended up a little bit squashed. Okay, so you can see that this one's nicely symmetric to this one. Okay, right, so I'll colour them both in in green here. So these are the two lateral ventricles, the left lateral ventricle here in orange, and then the right lateral ventricle here also in orange. Oops, missed the wall there. Okay, right, then we'll highlight the hypothalamus in, in pink again. So all of this, this then is the hypothalamus the left side of the hypothalamus and then the right side of the hypothalamus. Okay, so how then is the third ventricle going to connect to these first and second ventricles? And as I say, I don't know if there is, you know, a way of numbering one, number one, and the other number two. Okay, I doubt it. They're both known as the lateral ventricles, but they are considered the first and second ventricles. Okay, and then you have a connection between the left lateral ventricle and the third ventricle and also between the right lateral ventricle and the third ventricle and these two little tubes here are known as the interventricular foramen or well uh, the interventricular foramina since we're talking about the plural here okay this will be called the left interventricular foramen and this will be called the right interventricular foramen okay but since we're talking about the plural here foramina the interventricular foramina. Okay, right. So that then is uh, the two first and second ventricles, the two lateral ventricles. Okay, so now we have discussed the ventricular system of the brain then. We've discussed that these are large chambers within the brain that are full of cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, so one of the key things then that happens in Alzheimer's disease is that these ventricles get larger, okay, and that corresponds with the rest of the brain getting smaller. So all of the nervous tissue of the brain is gradually degenerating, okay, so the amount of nervous tissue that you have in the brain is getting smaller, okay, and as that gets smaller, and what fills its place, basically, it's the ventricles. The ventricles get bigger and bigger and bigger and effectively uh, take up the room that is uh, being um, given away because of the degenerating neurons. Okay, right then. Uh, so I think we will call it there for this video, and in the next video what we'll go on to is discussing the histology of... Uh, of, well, the histological features of a brain section of someone suffering from Alzheimer's disease, which is what Alois Alzheimer described all those years ago, okay? And then we'll move on to discussing which particular portions of the brain are going to be affected by Alzheimer's disease and how that corresponds to uh, the symptomatic progression of the disease.